Good morning, Elgin Missionary Church, and welcome once again to Church Online. We are so thankful that you're here with us this morning. Thank you for tuning in, and we pray that you are blessed by this service. Let's pray and get this service underway. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for everyone watching online right now, uh, everyone who's in person, and just anyone who comes into some sort of communication with the message that is being conveyed in this online service. Thank you for friends, thank you for family, and thank you for this day. Uh, we, we praise you, Lord, and we just, we, we thank you so much for the opportunity to come together and worship you and grow closer to you. In Jesus' amazing name I pray, and I'm not ashamed. Amen. Enjoy the service.
I trust you've been enjoying this series on Joyride. It's a little different, I'm sure, but uh, we're actually just studying the Bible and Philippians chapter 2. Hmm. Some people think of Joyride as like going to uh, Candace Wonderland or Cedar Point or one of those other places. We used to have a family in our church who would uh, go to one of those theme parks and they would take gravel so that they could have a joy ride and not get sick, you know, not turn green. Uh, they just loved the joy ride so much. Things have changed a little bit, especially for those rich folks who uh, seem to have lots of money. Jeff Bezos and uh, Richard uh, Branson and William Satner, they all got a joy ride on a rocket to experience weightlessness up in space. And they came back with broad smiles and they looked very happy. But I don't think it's the kind of joy that Paul was talking about in his uh, epistle. And he talked about joy so much in Philippians. Hmm. He also, in Philippians, this passage we have just read, it's, it's, it is turning things upside down. In the vocabulary of our society, down is a reserved, as a word that's reserved for losers and cowards and the bear market. (laughs) We say down and out, downtrodden, downfall, downscale, downsize, downhearted, down under. And Down's antonym is up. And that's the word that's kind of reserved for the up people, for winners and heroes. We say things like upscale, up and coming, upper class, upwardly mobile. (laughs) And we believe in ascending to fame and money and power and comfort and pleasure. (laughs) From the world's perspective, up is the only way to go. Just as the comfort, the compass point points north, so the human needle points up. But Jesus came into the world and modeled something totally different. He said, the way to joy and fulfillment is not up, it's down. It's humiliating yourself in a sense. It's giving up things. The way is down. The way to find happiness is to become a servant and put on the needs of others first. Such a difference. Such a different world. And so today after this message you say, you may say that Pastor Oki, he is nuts (laughs) that's a crazy thing that he's saying (laughs) we just can't get over this 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 story that's probably why christmas is so fascinating the incarnation god becoming man coming down and dwelling amongst us. Paul starts out this Philippians chapter 2 and talks about how wonderful it is to be unity and to be in love with one another. And then he says, this mind should be in you. Maybe a better word is attitude. That's kind of like my first point, is we need the attitude that Christ has. Keep on thinking this among you. This was also the mind of Christ. If one's outlook is selfish, actions are going to be divisive, self-serving, only concerned about self. We'll be saying, this is mine. I have a right to this. You have no right to demand that of me. I'm a free agent. The attitude of Christ was he gave up his rights. 
His, his appearance was that he was in the nature God. He was everywhere present. He was all-knowing. He was all-powerful. But he gave up all those privileges to be found in fashion like us. And sometimes people say, well, Jesus doesn't understand me. He's God. Oh, yes, but he came and dwelt among us. He was tested in all points like we. He knows what we're going through. He remembers our frame. This Jesus is so special. He didn't think that equality with God was something to be hung on to. It was not robbery to let it go. He gave it up willingly. He did not consider. He didn't perceive or understand that God-likeness means that we grasp, that we seize, that we hold on to our own advantage, but we're freely willing to give. He was all power, but he gave it up. Instead of using privileges for himself, he says, I'm going to use them for others. This is a simple story, but uh, kind of an illustration of how this kind of plays out. There was a grandfather went to see his grandson, and uh, he went into the room where his grandson was, and he was in a play. This grandson was in a playpen, and as soon as he saw Grandpa, he said, "Grandpa, Grandpa, wants Grandpa to pick him up." And so Grandpa was so glad to go over and grab his grandson and pick him up, and then started playing with him in the room. And about five minutes later, Mother comes in and says. What are you doing out of your playpen? I told you to stay there because you were behaving badly. So Grandpa is then kind of torn. Like, I, I, I've countermanded Mom. Like, <laughs> and so he put little Jeremy back into the playpen. But of course, the little kid says, Grandpa, Grandpa, play with me, play with me. Story goes that Grandpa got in the playpen with Jeremy to play with him. Kind of a small illustration of what God does for us. <laughs> he became a servant. And again, we can't really get our mind around this, but a servant, a bond servant, a slave, in Jesus' time, owned nothing, not even the clothes on his back. Everything he had, including his life, belonged to his master. Now, Jesus did own his own clothes, but he owned no land, no house, no gold, no jewels. He owned no business. He had no boat. He had no horses. Can you believe that? Margaret's de devastated. How can anybody live without a horse? <laughs> mm. He had to borrow a donkey to ride into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. He had to borrow a room for the Last Supper. He had to borrow a tomb to be buried in. <laughs> he refused advantages and special services to himself. But this king of kings was willing to become a bond servant whose humanity was real. He laid aside his Shekinah glory to be found among us. We call it his humiliation. <laughs> he gave it all up. And we as God's people at times say, well, I'm a servant. Sometimes the people who serve us in politics also say that they are a servant. And this is all well and good to talk this way. But I've noticed, especially for myself, when you start treating me like a servant, that's a whole different story. I don't like it when you treat me like a servant. I want to be treated as somebody special. 
But Jesus gave it all up. Gave it all up for you and for me. And what gets me is the Bible says he learned obedience. He learned obedience. I mean, he's God. He's willing to, he's able to give orders and things happen. And he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. I don't want to learn anything through suffering. (laughs) I don't know about you. But he learned obedience. When our children were little and Margaret was teaching them music lessons, our one daughter didn't mind playing the piano once she knew the song. But every time Margaret assigned her a new song to learn for that week or whenever and to perfect, there was tears, there was weeping and wailing and and gnashing of teeth. But once she knew the song, that was was beautiful. Learning obedience. All of this voluntary. All of this by his own will. And so did he become a loser? Was he a dope? (laughs) No. Giving up things got him everything got him everything (laughs) because of Jesus' voluntary humiliation God lifted him up and gave him a name which is above every other name we think going down and humiliating uh, and humbling ourselves is terrible. We think if he bought that house, well, that would be poverty. You know, we've got to get the right house. (laughs) It didn't seem to matter to Jesus. The Bible says, humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. And he will lift you up higher and higher and higher. (laughs) At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess. There'll be acknowledgement that he is Lord of all. There'll be adoration because everybody will confess that Jesus Christ is king. They'll either confess it in joy or they'll confess it in shame. So, humbling yourself. That's not an easy process. And the first few verses talk about what's necessary. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition. (laughs) We are all into self-promotion. And uh, you only have to look at Facebook to say that. Because, you know, we, we have a persona on Facebook or, or something else. We let people know all the good stuff about us, but we don't really talk about the bad stuff. Why? Because we want people to think well of us. We are often motivated by selfish ambition that we would become something, that we would be recognized, that we would be up. Jesus would have none of that. Ambition is okay. The ambition to serve the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, that's a great ambition. But let nothing be done through selfish ambition or through conceit. And conceit is not really a word that we use much anymore. Are you conceited? Conceit is thinking too highly of oneself, having an excessive self-interest and preoccupation. I've always been surprised at people who notice other people who are narcissistic. You know, they are so narcissistic. They're, they're a narcissist. They're probably because we ourselves are indulging because it's, in a sense, our human thing that we do that we have this 
self-preservation, self-looking after, self-importance. Hmm. The antidote to that is let each of us esteem the other better than ourselves. And I think this is a, a, a hard one for all of us to do. We think we've got the answers. You talk to me very long and I'll tell you how to solve the problems of the world. <laughs> no, I won't. But, uh, you know, we have an opinion. All of us do. And we think our opinion's right. When someone crosses us, how do we react? Do we still keep loving? Or do you think, I, I don't really need that person in my life. Let each esteem the other as better than yourself. That, that, that's a hard one. And yet I think this is a, a beautiful illustration of how the church operates. The, the church is the church. The church is the unique organism that God gave the world. You see, if I look at you more highly than I look at myself, and you look at me more highly than you look at yourself, it means that everybody in the church is thought of highly and is valued as an, as an, as, and is important. Don't look out <coughs> after your own interest. Esteem others as better than yourself. How, how do we do that? <coughs> Joy empties. Jesus emptied himself and became obedient to the death of the cross. We need to empty ourselves of our own ambitions, our own desires, our own conceitedness. You say, I don't need to worry about that conceitedness. I used to be conceited until I found out I was perfect. Conceit's a fault, and, and I don't have any. Let Jesus be the Lord of our life. Let's learn to esteem each other as better than ourselves. Don't look just to our own interests, but look to the interests of others. Commit your life to Christ. We really can't do it on our own strength. But humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. Dear Lord Jesus, as you look at your word, we, we see so many truths. And Lord, as we look for joy, we kind of think that maybe there'll be something external that's going to make it happen. But we understand that happiness and joy is an inside job. And Lord, as we empty ourselves of our ego, as we submit ourselves to you and allow your life to be in us, that's when we find joy. When we look to other people's interests, that's when we find joy. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. When I'm at my end, you just can't start it. When I hit a wall, that you just walk through. When I face a mountain, you are the maker, so it's got to move. When I'm out of faith, and you are still faithful. When I'm at my
when I'm breaking, that you'll be working. Ooh. When there's no way out, this one thing I know, that you're still on your throne. So whatever I'm feeling, I still got a reason. 